Monarch, Legacy of Monsters, an Apple original series. The world is on fire. I decided to do something about it. On November 17th. This place, it's not ours. Believe me. The most massive event of the year arrives. If you come with me, you'll know everything, I promise. Oh my God, go, go, go! Monarch, Legacy of Monsters. Streaming November 17th, only on Apple TV+. Plus. Level up your listening with Bose Quiet Comfort Ultra Earbuds and Headphones with immersive sound and world class noise cancellation for a not so silent night. Visit Bose.com slash Spotify to shop sound that's more than a present. I just want to jump in here with a quick note about some changes that are happening. This podcast is now going ad supported. What that means is I will be releasing select episodes from the hundreds of episodes I have archived now on Patreon and releasing them here. There'll be a lot more content and hopefully a lot more useful things for you guys to listen to. We do have to warn you, though, that a lot of these were recorded a couple of years ago during 2020 especially. So those episodes may be out of order pandemic-wise. However, I have gone through them and deemed that the parenting information was still really relevant. So just be aware that some of these releases may be out of order chronologically. But again, I thought the information was useful enough for you guys to want to hear it. Also, if you would like to listen to the podcast ad-free, you can still join Patreon. I'll still be releasing podcasts there with a few bonuses. One is that it will be ad-free. One will be that you get the podcast slightly earlier than everybody else. And I'll also be doing a bonus episode every month with a Q&A that's patron-specific. So if that's something you'd like to do, you can join for a dollar a month, and we'll see you there. Thanks, guys. Hey, I'm Jamie Glowacki, and you are listening to Oh Crap, I Love My Toddler, But Holy Fuck. This is a podcast for conscious parents who drop the F-bomb a lot. Hey, hey. Okay, today I want to talk about rhythm, routine, and rituals, and also anxiety. So it's May 2nd. I'm recording this on May 2nd. And there is, of course, talk of reopening our society slowly but surely. Now, that means we got to talk about a few things because we're not going to go gently into new normal, right? And I want you guys to know that I'm trying to give relevant information, you know, in these episodes dealing with the pandemic because that's where we are now. But also, you know, if you're listening to this in the future, I also am trying to provide the information that you might need in general, not pandemic specific. So I'm trying to walk that line because I do think rhythm, routine and rituals and anxiety are huge issues that we need to deal with even outside of the pandemic. The pandemic, of course, is amping it up and making it hit kind of crazy levels. Yeah. So look, you guys, even if everything opened up tomorrow, like on a dime, there's still going to be these huge transitions, right? And these are going to lead to huge feelings on your child's part. And remember, we had in the last couple of episodes, we really talked about feelings versus reactions. And I know that confuses a lot of parents quite often. They're like, I don't get it. When is it a reaction? When is it a feeling? So as we slowly reopen society, we are looking at 100% feelings coming out of your kids. And in fact, the last couple of weeks dealing with large amount of feelings. So we are going to collectively as a as a society as a planet there's going to be like a lot of mental health cleanup <laughs> for sure both with us and with our kids and sort of getting back to real life i know a lot of parents are contacting me a lot of parents are I mean, in my personal life are like what are we going to do what are we going to do about separation anxiety and clinginess so i definitely want to talk about that if you follow my work you know that i am I'm just super against overscheduled activities, keeping your kid busy, busy, busy. But I am a huge proponent of rhythm and routine. Okay. So rhythm is like the, the flow of your day and routine is the thing that happens within that. Rituals are routines that are infused with love and your own family's flavor. Right. So we all have different rituals within our family, even though we might, it might, you know, parents of toddlers generally try to keep the same routine, right? Bed at seven, nap, 
you know, wake up at this time, breakfast, play time, that kind of thing. The rituals are sort of the exact things that you do in your family. So the interesting thing about this pandemic is that like when it first started, I think the big thing was that we had to find a new rhythm. And that's, you know, if you recall how disorienting those first couple of weeks were, I don't know, I like I'm super organized, you guys. I got lists and I'm I don't, I'm just a very organized person. I'm very pragmatic and I was lost. I was like floating around watching 10 hours of friends and, you know, unfocused as, as most of us are. And uh, yeah, and it was just because the rhythm of our day was disrupted. And as a culture in general that thrives on busy, when you have no bumper, I guess, to like bump against, your rhythm is thrown off. So it's like when people retire, right? Like you have a day and it's super structured. So like you do, you do laundry, you do laundry at six o'clock in the morning because you got to get that laundry in before you leave for work so that when you get home, you can put it in the dryer, right? When you don't have to go to work, all of a sudden it's like, eh, I'll do the laundry later, maybe. And it never gets done. Right? So it definitely, it took us, I think, all a while to kind of find this new rhythm. For me, it took me, you know, I'll just share mine because that's what I do here. I really had to realize that I was losing focus by like 10 or 11. I get up, I get up stupid early. You guys, I get up at like 334 and I like to go for a trail run and I like to, you know, like I'm recording this and it's, you know, 530 in the morning. So that's my stupid routine. <laughs> but of course I fade. I like to get all, I've always homeschooled. So I like to get all my computer work done, all, you know, all my work, like podcasts. I like to, you know, get back to clients. I like to, you know, plan my Instagram posts and, and record podcasts and those kinds of things. I like to do that all before Pascal wakes up so that when he wakes up, I'm available, you know, to help, you know, facilitate his learning, but also if we have activities to do. So I've kind of always done that. And what I realized is is we didn't have activities to do, obviously, or to leave the house, I should say, right? And so it took me a while to figure out that by like 10 or 11, that's when I would start scrolling Facebook. I would lose it. I would just lose my attention. I would lose focus. And so it started to be like, ah, wasted time, you know? So I was like, oh, okay, this this is the time I need to watch a movie and just chill out and maybe take a nap. Because what I started to realize is, and this is pandemic specific, by 3.30, I almost had a second wind and I could work again, which is which is awesome because usually because I wake up so stupid early, you guys by like four or five o'clock, I'm winding down, right? And then Pascal and I might do something in the evening and we might, you know, watch a movie together or watch a program together. But what's happening is his social time is now at like five or six o'clock. It's like teenage happy hour. It's hilarious. And so that is the new rhythm that we've kind of found. So he's like, mom, can I be on, you know, can I be on FaceTime or a video game that they all play together and they're all in headsets and that's his social time. So I'm like, yeah, totally. So that's like our new rhythm. So I'm watching a movie or I'm watching stupid television midday, which is against my very moral fiber. <laughs> but you know, I'm doing useless shit anyway. I'm what scrolling Facebook. That's not helping anybody. What trying to find, you know, a reputable news source on <laughs> good information for the pandemic. That's not helpful. I mean, it's helpful to try, but I don't, I haven't found one yet. <laughs> um, so, you know, so that's, that's the thing is I found this new rhythm. That's almost crazy. My friend Jen was telling me her kids surprised her with a what did the, oh, I forgot what she called it. It was like a surprise party and they woke her up and they planned on watching a movie at 730 in the morning. And of course she was like, you know, we like we can't do this. Like you feel so guilty about watching a movie at 730 in the morning. And it just it was perfect. She was like, you know what, maybe we'll do this every day because it just eased into the day. So it created this whole new rhythm to the day. And I think it's taken us all a real long time to find that. And I also think that you have to remember that this is what has happened to our kids. Their rhythm has been upset, right? This overarching wave, the big chunks, right? That got thrown off. The routine probably stayed very similar. Your kids get up, you feed them breakfast, right? But here's something that is kind of crazy. 
all my clients, everybody I'm working with is saying, you know, uh, well, no, my kid doesn't know what's going on. I would say, so again, this is May 2nd. I would say the third week in April, I started to notice professionally and personally the kid's anxiety peaking. And I'm talking about out of, seemingly out of the blue, bizarre behaviors, of course, potty training accidents, sleep disruptions, all kinds of crazy behavior. And so I'm working with people, and, you know, and talking to my friends and everything. And I'm like, okay, well, it's anxiety. No, no, no. My kid doesn't even know what's happening. I'm going to stop right here and say, are you fucking kidding me? You guys, I don't care if you have been very cautious to not say the word coronavirus. I don't care how careful you think you've been. Our little ones thrive on nonverbal communication. They 100% know that they're not leaving the fucking house. They 100% know that mom and dad are working from home. Somebody, they're not seeing grandma and grandpa. They 100% know that something's going on. Okay. And so There's anxiety. There's anxiety because that rhythm, the rhythm of the day, again, the routine might stay the same, but the rhythm of the day is totally whacked. Now, I want to take a huge left turn here and talk about anxiety. I guess not a huge left turn, but uh, (laughs) I want to stop everything and talk about the anxiety because this is intense and it's so important. And what you have to remember is... (laughs) I, I'll be working with private clients and invariably everybody said, well, you don't understand, like we're used to going out. And so you don't understand like, like how hard it is being stuck. Guys, I don't know how many ways to say this, but like literally we're all in the same position, you know, various levels of lockdown, depending on who you have in your home and, you know, vulnerabilities and all of that. But like, there's going to be the biggest fucking mental health cleanup. Like this is going to be bad. So like, you're not in this alone. So it's like survive now and know that we're going to like be in it together too, for the mental health cleanup. You know what I'm saying? So right now, a lot of parents are wondering, you know, well, either I get two things. I either get parents wondering like, okay, what, what do I look for, for anxiety? And then I have parents who are like, their kids are off the wall exhibiting all the anxiety. And they're like, nah, 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 this is just shitty behavior. And I'm like, no, (laughs) So when we look at anxiety and a lot of psychologists right now are putting out big lists of of what to look for and you look at these lists for anxiety and it kind of cracks you up because you're like, well, holy shit, this is like every crappy toddler behavior literally is a sign of anxiety. So it can kind of be not helpful, right? So what I want to do, and I talked about this, I I talked about this in some past episodes, we want to look at behavior and actually look at pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. And what you want to look at is like, is this a new behavior or is this an amped up behavior? So let's say your kid was like always kind of fresh, you know, like, no, go away is a big one right now. Like, no, no, go away. I want mommy. Like, okay, were they kind of doing that and now it's amped up or is this like totally new? And either way, you know, you get a little screwed. I because they're both signs of anxiety, right? But it's like, you have to take a gauge, a litmus test because brand new behavior, like I hear this so often. I don't know what happened. Like two weeks ago, she started with this and I'm like, well, I know what happened. The anxiety peaked in the pandemic. (laughs) And any shitty behavior your kid had is going to be amped up. And what we're working with when I work with my private clients is that uh, I work with the idea that like, We want to lean in and give the child the love and the safety they need. But if this was a behavior that was already shitty before the pandemic, we can deal with that pretty much as a behavior, right? There's a layer of anxiety on top of it, but it's, it's something that still needs to be dealt with, dealt with because it's still going to be here after the pandemic, right? But if it's a brand new behavior, you go, okay, let's see, let's see what we need to do about this. So I'll talk more about that in a minute. A big thing, and I just said it, like, go away. I want mommy. Huge, 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 you guys, right now is a a mommy clinginess. I am hearing like a few isolated cases where it's all daddy and mommy's being rejected, but it's, this is cold and hard, man, because when I say it's a clinginess to either mom or dad, I'm talking about like full rejection of the other parent. Like, I don't like you. Daddy's my best friend. Go away. So it's really intense. And 
guys, just like I talked about in the last episode about the like, I don't love you. You're not my friend. Do not take this personally. I got moms who are like crushed because mom's being rejected and and dad's <laughs> dad's the favorite. And and don't be crushed. Don't get on that emotional roller coaster like it's just your kid acting out. And so which doesn't mean we feed it and doesn't mean we accept it. And this is a huge Huge, huge issue I'm seeing right now. So it's the rejection of one parent that turns into a controlling dictatorship. And I see this, this was a big problem before the pandemic. So it looks like cute behavior, right? It looks like this, it looks like your kid saying, no, 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 don't sit next to me, daddy. I want mommy to sit next to me. And pretty soon, like it escalates till dad is eating dinner in the bathroom. And I've literally seen this like in more than one case. And the child's like, no, daddy, you go eat your dinner in the bathroom. And everybody gets, Everybody does it because you got this tiny dictator, right? Who might throw a fit and bring down the house. So you don't want to, you don't want to feed into this. And especially, you know, moms, you need a break. Dads, you need a break. Like we cannot give into this, like only mommy or only daddy. You can lean into it and say, you know what? I think you need a lot of love right now. I can see you're very angry. I can see that you want mommy, but both parents are equal. So don't give into that that form of dictatorship because it gets out of control. And what happens, especially if we're looking at it through an anxiety lens, it feeds the anxiety, right? Because the child doesn't feel that emotional swaddling of boundaries that I constantly talk about, right? They're, they're, they're um, getting amped up. And so if they're given control, they're going to run with it in the wrong direction. So it's that emotional swaddling of saying, I've got this and no, you're not in charge. You don't have to be in charge, little one. I got this. I'm going to keep you safe. And it's going to be my rules and my way, not in a power hungry way, but to keep your child safe emotionally. So I, I can't say that enough. What's happening is there's anxiety and the parents don't know what to do. So they start skirting around it and it feeds the anxiety. Your child does not want this control. Your child psychologically does not want this control. So even though they might throw a fit to have it, it's still not good for them. So what's really good for them is a strong, firm voice and, and actions that say, you don't have to worry about this. Your child directing two grown-ups' actions is far too much control, and they don't want that. And you need to say, I got this. I'm a grown-up. I'm going to handle my actions, and I'm going to help you handle yours, okay? So that kind of brings us to like, when do you give in? And, and lean in and how do you deal with it when you think you're dealing with anxiety? Kids want to always be reassured that they are loved and they are safe. So when you do see some of this anxiety, this is your choice. But what you need to know is that everything you choose now is going to become a habit, right? Because we're going to do it for the rest of the pandemic. So, so you have to kind of think carefully. You want to, Think ahead and and say, okay, do I feel like dealing with this later? So I'll take an example. A huge example is co-sleeping right now. Like kids are nervous. They want to sleep with mom and dad and parents are like, I don't care. That's fine. Me personally, I don't care about co-sleeping. I, I, kids get out of your bed in a natural flow. I don't, I have no problem with co-sleeping except if it affects one or the other spouses or it affects the family sleep. But if it works for everybody, go for it. And I think that kids want to co-sleep because they're not being manipulative. I think they want warmth and they want love and to feel swaddled all night, you know, in, in parental love. So I, I don't personally care about that. If you personally care about that, and this goes against your sort of the, the, the fiber of your being. And you're like, no, I don't, you know, before the pandemic, you had this thought of, I don't believe kids should sleep with their parents ever. And now you're allowing your child to sleep. Just know that you're creating a habit that's going to need to be broken later. So that's sort of my jumping off point. You know, there's thousands of people are asking me so many questions and, and, and want these like super specific answers. And I'm like, it just depends. It depends on, you know, what it is. When do you give in? When do you not give in? Now, if your kid's like kind of anxious, like again, with the dictatorship, like you see that mom, you know, they're trying to control mommy and daddy. That's not one you give in on. Yeah. Because you can see down the road, it, it's going to take a left turn and it's going to get out of control. So I, that's the only thing I can really say on that. It's like, and it's okay. It's totally okay. You guys, I'm not, I, I'm not passing any judgment on how you guys are surviving this. What I do want to be clear is I want you to know 
what you're getting into. Cause I feel like we're all living this day to day existence. Like what harm can it do to give her, you know, to, to have her sleep with us? What harm can it do? None today. But what harm can it do later? I don't know. Are you going to just want to kick her out of your bed? How is that going to look? So that's all. Uh, that's like my broad strokes advice is like, just kind of know that it's not just surviving today. And I think that's generally what happens with all our kids crappy behavior, right? Is we do, we, we go like, well, just for today, but just for today turns into a, a different habit. So let's take a minute and talk about the when anxiety does take a really wrong turn because people are definitely asking me like, hey, can I check in? Like, does this seem normal? Does this is this like a normal level of anxiety or has it gone into not normal? So I want to use that sort of parameter is like, what can we expect as normal and what uh, where does it really start going bad? This shit is hard, you guys. This like what we're experiencing, I'm thrilled that we at least have this like glimmer of hope that like we're, we're opening society. I know like in my state, the governor just canceled like all big summer events. We I live in Rhode Island. So we have like the Newport Jazz Festival, the Newport Folk Festival. We have these big summer things that aren't happening. So but we, we are going to open parks and and things like that and stay under groups of 10. So that's sort of our plan. Um, it just kind of depends on on how things are going for you guys. But I feel like at least we have this like glimmer of hope, right? That things are going to be different. So when we look at like what's normal, what's not normal, it's it's also in a larger context, right? With it, because I feel like, again, there's pre-pandemic, there's post-pandemic, there's during pandemic and anxiety is so peaked. It's like, when does it, again, that barometer of like what's normal, what's not normal. So for me, the whole barometer is when it interrupts or affects your quality of life. That's when it's kind of slipped into not normal. Literally the whole pandemic, I have two running race buddies and we have done trail running through the whole thing. So we've, you know, had talks in the morning, early morning and, uh, and their kids are younger than Pascal. So it's kind of fun. And they both have kids who are nine. And one thing we have noticed, and this is this is not pandemic specific. This is just a general anxiety that sort of happens. We were talking about when a child's room becomes a shrine. And Pascal was like this, like his room, it wasn't actually his bedroom. It was more, he had a, a mod, he was really into model trains, like really into model trains to the exclusion of everything else. <laughs> and so we had this, we had a spare room and set up a huge train table. I mean, it was super fly. I did all the electronics. It was like this crazy two, three year project. He saved all his money. He asked for gift cards. It was like his thing. However, it became a shrine and he he played with it, but nobody could touch it. And so he started having anxiety. Like if I we had people over. People couldn't go in the room. People couldn't touch things. And then it started to overflow into his bedroom. And then it was like, don't touch my Legos. Don't touch my stuff. And it became this like really big anxiety. Like I could see this kid have getting close to a panic attack because a few friends were over. And, you know, we even, I we have some, we had some friends at the time who would like just kind of go through shit like maniacally. So I was like, okay, it's fair. Like, I get that you don't want those kids to come over. You know, we did the like, hey, you don't have to share everything. You can put it up in your closet. I can put it in my bedroom. But it became like he didn't want the kids to touch anything. And it became a problem. He was choosing this stuff over connecting with friends or other humans. And so like we had a long talk and I was like, you know what, buddy, I think we need to take your train table down. It's affecting, we can't have people over. It's it's affecting your life and you want to play with your friends, but I can see your panic. And he was like, hey, Pascal's always been very wise like this. He said, uh, yeah, I need help. I need help with this. Like he could sense that it was out of control. And so we dismantled the train table and we, you know, had long, and he was sad and he cried. <laughs> but we also just kind of focused on like, hey, this was starting to trip the crazy wire in your head a little bit. And and we have to take proactive measures because the most important thing for me, this is what I believe the most important thing is human connection. And so when it starts to affect human connection and quality of life, then we have to look at it as above and beyond normal. Monarch Legacy of Monsters, an Apple original series. The world is on fire. I decided to do something about it. On November 17th. This place, it's not ours. 
believe me. The most massive event of the year arrives. But if you come with me, you'll know everything, I promise. Oh my God, go, go, go! Monarch Legacy of Monsters, streaming November 17th, only on Apple TV+. Plus. So I think what I'm seeing, again, during this time is like a lot of OCD stuff. But again, does it affect the quality of life? Can you not leave the house because your child needs to um, clean up stuff? Um, I have a friend who, uh, her poor little one. So he is a true, true, true extrovert. And what I'm realizing during this pandemic is that I really think true extroverts are the rarer the rarer species, you know, I think most of us lean more towards introvert and we might have extroverted qualities. Like everybody thinks I'm an extrovert and I'm like, oh God, no, I have to recharge. You know, I recharge by myself. And that's, you know, when I read a definition about introverts versus extroverts, it's how you recharge. Do you recharge in the presence of others or do you recharge alone? And I have always struggled with this because I've, you know, I've had long-term relationships that I'm like, God, you got to get out of the room. And they're like, oh, I just want to kind of be in the same room with you. I won't talk to you. And I'd be like, you are breathing my air. <laughs> so, so I'm an introvert that like has extrovert qualities, right? And so this poor little guy, he, a true, true introvert, and he started to go, it started to really affect him, the the lockdown. And so um, like exhibiting OCD behaviors and such that, you know, my friend said, is this normal? Is it not normal? I was like, dude, this is a little beyond normal. Like it was getting a little scary. And so she and I like talked about things and I said, like, can't, you know, she does, she lives across the country. And I said, you know, can you find somebody else who's been really safe? Like, I just, I feel like for mental health, your kid needs to go be with somebody. And so she did, she found, she found two friends who had stayed safe. And I know, you know, depending on your thoughts on this, you know, is anybody truly safe? Blah, 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 blah. But I also think that nobody's factoring in mental health uh, enough. And that's just our society, right? Fuck mental health. It doesn't count. Like you should, you should just do the thing. But if you're going fucking crazy and your kid, and I'm not talking about baby crazy, like, oh my God, I'm so stir crazy. I'm talking about mental health being affected. And this little guy, his mental health was being affected for sure. And so he got to like hang out and play ball. So it was still, you know, kind of distance, but he had human interaction and boom, all his symptoms sort of like, you know, slowly dissipated. And so it was, and it wasn't not even slowly dissipated. Like she called me up and she was like, oh my God, he's a different kid. So glad we did this. So I think, you know, number one, of course, get mental health help if you can, but also where this is all leading as we start to reopen society. And so it's going to be hard, but you have to look at quality of life, right? So is the anxiety affecting quality of life? And that's when you should reach out and get help. And I know, Ray Hart, it's really hard right now because we can't go see psychologists and psychiatrists, you know what I mean? But you have to gauge that like, wow, is my kid... What you want to look for is behavior that starts to be singularly focused, like the child can no longer, you know, connect with other humans because they're so entrenched in this certain behavior. Now, there's just your regular shitty behavior again, like, where you know, if your kid was prone to tantrums, you're going to see more tantrums. And some of that is just ride it out, you know. So I'm talking about very specific. It usually manifests, I think, as OCD sort of behaviors, you know, uh, consistently washing hands. I know some kids have tripped out slightly older with the virus. Am I clean? Am I dirty? Germs, that kind of thing. So that's what you want to look for. Is it is it affecting their quality of life? But now I want to talk about your anxiety because this is also a key component. There is something called generational trauma. Okay. And so I think we look at generational trauma, especially with our little guys here year because our little guys don't have the logic behind it. Yeah. And I don't want to be like super scary and shit, you guys, but we need to name this so we can be on the lookout for this. And side note, I had this fucking amazing 11th grade teacher, my junior high school, which was American history. That was the curriculum. And you knew you were getting this long ass huge book that was going to break your back in your backpack. And um, my the teacher you know, pretty much was like, hey, guess what? You guys aren't, we're not going to do uh, George Washington and that BS. She said, you guys were born in 1968. You were born at the tail end of the Vietnam War. 
and you guys live through some generational trauma and you need to know why that is because you were too little to understand it. And I'll never forget that. And it was, oh my God, it was so amazing. I know I'm going off on a tangent here, but I don't care. <laughs> it was so amazing because we came home and the, you know, the thing about the Vietnam War was that People were so against the war that they were against the soldiers. So when the soldiers came back, you know, they the vets, they didn't get the help they needed. They were all super PTSD, alcoholic. They were just, it was a mess, but they didn't get the help. They were totally blown off. And so I was able to come home and engage my parents and my stepdad. Oh my God, it was amazing. He had a, he had a reel to reel, you guys, like a reel to reel, you know, like, uh, I don't know, like from the 1960s. And he would make like, mix tapes on this reel to reel and send them like to his parents. So he would do like a video, like a, a recording and he had them down in the basement. And so he would play them for me and you could hear the gunshots and you could hear, you know, all the like war in the background. So anyways, like an amazing teacher, an amazing thing to do sort of history that we were a part of, but too little to understand. And, and this teacher really really believe that, that even though we were young, we were two or, you know, one, two, three years old, that, that having this war was a part of our consciousness. So why I bring that story up is because whether or not you think your kids being affected, they are. And a uh, very interesting story about generational trauma. After 9-11, I, I read this article where this guy was a sidewalk Santa in Manhattan. And he said it was horrible after 9-11 because parents wouldn't let their kids they wouldn't let their kids go. The kids had separation anxiety. They didn't want to, you know, and the parents sort of, he could see the parents panicking to let their kids hand go. And the, he could see the kid pick it up, pick up that vibe. And so that is happening. Okay. So what we want to do is we want to look like, how can we start to like, how can we mitigate it a little, or at least what does it look like so that we know what the mental health cleanup is down the road, right? Because I think a lot of this stuff, like we can't help as much as we want to put on our poker face with our kids, we can't help it, right? So we want to at least be able to know this is in our head. You don't want your kid to like go to therapy when they're 23 and be like, oh, mom, I have generational trauma. And you're like, what the fuck is that? <laughs> like we want to be aware of it so we can help our children, like, you know, through the next few years, deal with this. So listen, part of this is that everybody is literally in a different lockdown position. So some people, like I described my, our governor, the way we've worked it in Rhode Island, we've tested the most at first. Like we've always had this stay under five. We can't, they closed all the parking lots to public spaces. But if you are in walking distance, the governor's like, get out, get your vitamin D, exercise, stay sane, five or under. And that's been our rule. I know other places have been like, stay in your house. And I think depending on your situation, are you vulnerable? Is your child super vulnerable? Uh, do you live with your parents who are vulnerable? That kind of thing affects everybody different. So everybody is literally in a different lockdown sort of position, right? So that's, that's important to remember because, you know, the more severe, the more your child's going to pick up. So Literally, I've worked with some people who are super high risk. So they stay, have not left the house for six weeks, have not left the house at all, get groceries delivered, cleaning the groceries, leaving the groceries out, doing the whole like sort of super careful protocol. However, that in it of itself is anxiety producing, right? Like, and so the idea that your child is just going to carry on because you've kept the routine, right? We go back to that rhythm and routine. Well, no, they don't know what's going on. They have breakfast the same way they do. We watch TV, you know, you guys are crazy if you think that your child's not being affected. They're listening, they're watching, and they're picking up the vibe, okay? And when I say vibe, I mean nonverbal communication. And I have been relating this like dogs, right? Your average three-year-old is on par with your average dog brain-wise, Yeah. Does your dog know when you're going on vacation? Yeah, your dog knows when you're going on vacation, even before you pull out a suitcase, because your dog's picking up on everything. Your dog doesn't understand extensive language, right? So your kids may not be uh, understanding all the words you're saying, but they're most certainly picking up the fact that you're panicking about the groceries, right? Not that you're panicking, but that like, um, it, this is super severe, okay? So- all I'm asking you is, yes, we want to be mindful. Of course, we don't want to create panic in our kids, but a lot of this can't be controlled. You know, again, even with your best poker face, everything's fine. <laughs> it's still, it's still affecting the kids. So listen, just don't be shocked. That's all I'm asking. 
again and again and again, I'm saying this, we're going to have to deal with massive men- mental health stuff when this is over. I just want you to be aware of these things so that you're not like, I think the worst thing we can do is think, oh, my kid's fine. My kid's fine. I don't know why they're acting like this. My kid's fine. No, they're not. (laughs) No. (laughs) I mean, we're fine in this moment, but we're not your kids. You know, we can't just blow this off. So how we reopen is going to be very different. So one thing that I'm sure of is we're not going from lockdown back to school. So you're not going to be in this position where it's like, okay, I've been in my house for six to eight weeks, you know, solo, nothing. And then all of a sudden, boom, here we go. And your kid's back in school or daycare and you go to work full time. So I'm I'm 99% sure that that's not going to happen. And of course, my ideal when I look on the horizon is I think that and it's wonderful, I think, because we are at the end of the school year. So we'll have summer, you know, the weather is getting nice for, uh, you know, those of us who have, you know, harsher winters. And so hopefully summer will start to open and uh, we can start getting out with friends again. And so there'll be this sort of get your feet wet in, in the pool slowly. Right. And I'm hoping that I'm hoping that's what it looks like. I don't know. I'm hearing it. there's all kinds of shit flying around as far as like kids might have to go back to school. Parents might have to go right back to work. You know, I'm hoping it's not that abrupt and I don't see it happening that way, at least in the way our state is talking. So but this is the place where number one, you want to create your new rhythm, right? And again, it's probably going to be a temporary rhythm or a summer rhythm because it might look like we're only going to meet our friends for an hour at the park and then we're going to go home again and we might only have somebody, you know, in the backyard for dinner. It's going to be a slower transition, but you'll find a new rhythm. I'm imagining my new rhythm is not going to include a movie or, you know, three episodes of Friends at noon. I'm imagining, <laughs> but who knows, you know, maybe that's something I'll keep. But this is where, so you guys listen, this is where you want to take note. This is the transition, the slow transition. So don't think the transitions once your kid goes back to daycare or once you go back to work or once we're just like totally free to roam the country. This opening, these first few outings are going to be where you want to note anxiety. This is the place to be aware. And remember, whatever your kid has experienced, I don't know what your kid's going to do, but maybe... Maybe they're going to be freaked out. Oh my God, am I going to get sick? Wait, we're leaving the house. You know, it depends on how you've talked about it, how, what, what your child is aware of. And if your child really hasn't, has no clue of the actual language, hasn't heard the word coronavirus, has no idea about germs, whatever that is, your child might show that generalized anxiety. They might by being clingy, by separation anxiety. And I think this is a place where you can lean in. So if you go to the playground and your little one doesn't want to play with the other, you know, two kids or whatever, and just wants to sit on your lap, this is the place, I think, to let them sit on your lap. This is the place to ease that transition. And so my fear, what I when I look on the horizon and see what might be happening in the next few months is that that parents are going to, you know, we're going to jump in. We're going to be so excited to see each other, right? Parents are going to jump in and think, oh my God, my kid's so excited. Like my kid's going to be so happy that we're leaving the house. My kid's going to be great. And some kids might, some kids might be just fine, but other kids, this is where we, this is where the transition might be hard. So I encourage you to lean into that, particularly if your kid just wants to like sit on your lap or not really play. This is the place not to push it, to let them kind of come to it on their own. Okay. Again, I think the biggest thing we need to do is find this new rhythm. That's all. Find a new rhythm to the day. And again, it might be an an intermediate rhythm, you know, like it's not going to be the rhythm that we're looking at in September, but it's key to do that and not just rely on the routine. Right. And again, people are asking me like exact questions and I, I can't, You guys, it's literally every situation is different. Every situation is different as to when, who's working, when, out of the home, in the home, what level of seeing other people you've been at. Like, there's just no way. There's no way to answer like everything. There's no way to give you an exact script. There's no way to predict how this is going to go. Here's my general feeling. My general feeling is that when anxiety hits, every kid just needs physical contact to know they're loved and safe. They need emotional swaddling, but they need physical swaddling too, okay? And that is what we lean on. If their anxiety starts to manifest in controlling behavior, the controlling behavior needs to be nixed, but it can also be nixed with love. So that might look like you see this like dictatorship coming in, not go away, I want I want daddy. You can say, you know what? Daddy's not available, I'm here, but hey, you can I sit with you and give you some love? A really 
huge, great mantra is, do you need some love right now? The other thing is point out the controlling behavior. So I say this over and over again, when our kids have this weird behavior, we tend to try to want to fix it in the background without actually telling the kid like this is, you know, we don't reflect back to them. So you can point out to your child, hey, you know what? You're trying to control everybody. And sometimes that means that you're a little anxious inside and that can feel, give them sensations like fluttery. Do you feel like your heart is fluttery? Number one, this totally distracts them out of that crappy behavior, right? Like if you're asking your kid, do they feel fluttery in their heart? They're going to forget that they want to. Right. But also mental health is so ignored and we pay attention to feelings, but we don't pay attention to the actual emotional language and and pointing out and reflecting back like what is happening. So point out, hey, you're you're kind of acting like a little jerk. Sometimes that's because of anxiety. Are you feeling this? And maybe your child can articulate some feelings. And then bottom line mantra, hey, do you need some love right now? Because it's looking like you need some love. And I can guarantee you in this pandemic, especially right now, your child's going to be like, yes, mommy, I need some love right now. And so you make it a little meltdown and you can stop, drop and roll and just like be with your kid in that moment. Yeah. Now for rituals, as we go back into rituals, how to create these rituals, because these are going to help you with these transitions, right? With current levels of anxiety, we do want to be careful with rituals that they don't turn. We don't want to make them trip. The, I call it tripping the crazy wire. Yeah. So you want to like create rituals that uh, you want to stay away from numbers in particular. So like, you know, I know one family I'm dealing with, you know, they, they had a three kiss kind of rule and the child's anxiety got to be so high that number one, she was kept demanding more kisses, but also had to go back and do three more had to go back and do three more. And did I get my three? You know what I mean? So right now I feel like everybody's crazy wire is really present and and ready to be tripped. So we don't want to create that. And I think for little ones, staying away from numbers in particular can be helpful. But I know a lot of people use the American Sign Language sign for I love you. Very cool. You can just Google it if you don't know it. But that that's a ritual, right? Like in your kid can always look over at you on the playground or whatever and give you that sign and you give it back. Uh, transitional objects. So if you do find yourself like reopening and maybe your child has to go in somebody else's care, whether it's daycare or preschool or, you know, maybe just something at home to keep things small, make sure that they have transitional objects. These can be friendship bracelets, rubber jewelry, rocks, a painted rock. Pascal's used to be, um, it was a quartz, a rose quartz heart. It was little and he'd keep it in his pocket. And these get infused with mama and daddy love. And the child can keep it on their person or, you know, in a pocket or something. And it's a connection to you. So just like a blankie, I talk about transitional objects all the time. So I'm sure you guys know, you know, blankie, teddy bear, when they have to take all their shit with them in the car, what they're literally doing is trying to transition home to this new thing. So the new thing is scary or unsure. So let me take something of comfort with me. You know, you might want to wink. Maybe it's a secret handshake you guys have, like just a little secret handshake. The big thing you want to do is how can I create an emotional tether? So remember when your kids started to walk and they'd go like a couple of steps and then they'd like come back to you totally panicked, like, holy shit, I'm, I'm doing it. I'm on my own. And like the world all of a sudden opened up to them and they got freaked out and they just like ran back to your leg. I anticipate we're going to see a lot of that. Okay. And so what you were doing is you're creating an emotional line, an emotional tether that your child can kind of, you know, if you think about it as an invisible string that they can take with them as they ease onto the playground, as they ease into real life, as they go see, be with their friends. So you want to create that, that tether for them so they feel safe and secure and they can always come back to you. So I think I just came up with that walking analogy kind of on the fly, but I'm, it's sitting in my head right now. And I'm like, that is what it's going to be. So if you think back to those moments, I think that's what we're going to see a lot of as we reopen. Is this like your child's going to be happy for sure and still need to kind of come back to you. So again, go back to, do you need some love right now? I feel like you can't go wrong with, Do you need some love right now? All right, y'all. So I'm very excited because today, so I, these podcasts, usually it takes me like three or four hours to, to write them out because I don't want to, you guys know me. I talk all the time. (laughs) 
<laughs> and I go off on tangents and I get really excited. So today I'm excited because I like, I sketched out the basics and I wanted to see, cause I love, I love talking like on the fly. Cause I love imagining you guys in front of me and we're just having this conversation. So anyway, today was sort of a, a hallmark, a benchmark for me because I, I wrote the, the main point so I don't get off topic, but I was conversationally having a good time with you. So rock on you guys have an awesome day. All right. I'm going to sign off for today. You can always go to jamieglowacki.com for the super cool latest updates, including the launch of my new book, yummy new book presale treats, when we release new episodes, and how to work with me directly. And of course, if you need any potty training help, there's a handy link there that will take you to all my potty training resources, including all my courses. That's the Oh Crap Potty Training online course my pooping solutions course, and my night training supplement. And if you need additional help, how to book with a certified OCRAP consultant. That's all at jamieglowacki.com. Have a beautiful day and rock on.